thanks everybody for joining in this video. <clears throat> this was uh, a presentation I made to uh, the Canada Talks Climate Group. Um, my name is Maggie Hanna and I'm a fellow at the Energy Futures Lab. We are a group of people with a wide variety of expertise and a lot of different perspectives. And even though very often we do not agree, we are all benefited by actively hearing what each other of us has to say, even if we dismiss it later. We go into these conversations asking what can we learn about each other, our ideas so we can find common ground. So with that kind of a sensibility, I invite you to come on this ride with me today into the future. It's not easy, actually, to see something that has never been before. That, that is where we futurists come in. For years, I have spent two hours every morning scanning the world horizon for what's happening today to address climate change and everything that's related with it. So new technology, business models, policy and regulation, collaboration, commitments, plans, ways to address plastics and biodiversity, et cetera. And when you do that, um, patterns start to form up when you've been at it that long. And those patterns can be projected into the future. So I run a daily blog and it's called How the Future Can Go Really, Really Well. Originally, it was designed as a homeopathic remedy for uh, kids and especially with climate change, anxiety and depression and despair. So, so what they can hear about real and positive events um, on which to base hope, basically. But I'm finding all manner of older general public people joining in as well. Even some of my technically oriented colleagues have subscribed, subscribed to it. The website address is on the screen. Take a photo of it, of it if you wish, and I invite you to join. So let's start off with a brief uh, land acknowledgement. Oki, Abba Washtech, Tata Nastada, Tansi, Bonjour, Bonjour, and Hello. My name is Maggie Hanna, and my family is of Irish and Scottish ancestry. On the Scottish side, we've been here five generations in North America, arriving in 1884, and now consider ourselves Canadian. I'm also adopted into the Roan family by my beloved sister, Moss Roan of the Ehrman Skin Cree Nation and Mountain Cree Camp. For about three decades now, I'd say it was. And I'm very grateful to be here on and with these lands protected by First Peoples for tens of thousands of years. May we create space within our hearts and our minds to listen and consider and humbly contribute to positive futures where all of us, including First Peoples and all our relations walk together in a good way. So, a quick review. The lion's share of human-caused greenhouse gases comes from burning hydrocarbons, 62%. And another 16% is due to methane releases from both the hydrocarbon uh, supply chains and from agriculture. At the beginning of human civilization, the atmospheric CO2 number was 275 ppm. I was born at 315 ppm, and today's reading is 422 ppm, and that's a lot. The maximum safe level is considered to be 350 ppm. So bottom line is that we have run out of safe room in the atmosphere for more CO2, and we've reached a planetary boundary. So what can we say about energy transition that we're in? Here are some principles. There's no such thing as more sustainable. Either something is sustainable or it is not. There are no such things as, there's no such thing as clean energy. Only energy sources with lower life cycle greenhouse gas emissions than others. It's incumbent upon us as we go through this to maintain energy on demand and do not allow our system to devolve into energy only as available. 
we have to electrify everything we can. And I estimate Alberta's grid will need to expand two to three times to serve electric cars and heat pumps and other industrial electricity uses. We need to reduce and then stop burning fossil liquid fossil fuels for transportation, industrial scale heat, uh, space and water heating. We need to convert the main grid line uh, to multiple yet con connected MIDI grids. We need to increase energy storage of all kinds, stop energy waste, which is currently around 30%. Like, like even in your own homes, 30% of all the energy that comes into your house on average is wasted. So this means a change in our personal behavior. Another key principle is to design and build for robustness and not just resilience. This is key in an increasingly weird weather world where extreme weather events can tear into our energy infrastructure. Here is the analogy. Reptiles are resilient and mammals are robust. Reptiles are cold-blooded, cold calorie efficient. They need about a tenth of the calories compared to mammals. Uh, they are efficient. And they can run fast for short distances only, and they die when the weather gets too cold. Mammals, however, are robust. They're warm-blooded. They need 10 times the calories compared to a reptile. They're not efficient at all, and they can run fast for a really long time. And they thrive in cold weather. Resilience means that when a shock happens to our system, we suffer. And then we recover quickly. Robustness means that when a shock happens, we don't suffer. The system in place easily handles that shock. In any low carbon energy system we build, it has to be robust on many levels of scale from the family dwelling, to the neighborhood, to the, the, the hamlet or the city, to the region. What needs to be included in a robust low carbon energy system? Back up, back up. Back up, more backup <laughs> and sharing. That's the deal. Backup power plans that kick in automatically using smart grid technology, which optimize low carbon emissions. And, and flexibility in how energy is distributed according to the need of the moment. So that way cleaner energy systems seamlessly switch from one power source to another as needed. Equ Ideally, the lowest carbon footprint to the highest. Um, this slide shows what backup cascades could look like in Alberta. So from solar, that solar, the sun goes down. We kick in with batteries. They have very fast response time, but don't hold a lot of power. So while they're kicking in, we're heating up the solid oxide fuel cells, which have to be at temperature in order to turn hydrogen into electricity. And then they kick in, and when we're out of hydrogen, maybe we kick in the uh, uh, natural gas peaker plants with uh, um, CCS, CCUS, which is um, carbon capture, utilization, and storage, which is again makes those peaker plants low carbon. I also anticipate demand response. Electricity pricing will be part of Canada's not too distant future. What is that anyway? Well, it's a voluntary electricity rationing system that is accomplished by price incentives. Uh, it offers lower price for power in exchange for reduced power consumption during peak periods. So under demand response, uh, one would not choose to run the clothes dryer, right? Which is the highest power draw in your home. If you don't have, if you're not charging an electric car, which would then become the highest power draw. But so you wouldn't charge your car either, and you wouldn't run your clothes dryer during the 4 to 8 p.m. supper peak demand, right? Because it would just cost way too much. And we shouldn't be doing that now anyway, you know? So I think it's important to have a vision of what the future could look like. And so this is mine. If I were queen of the world, 
what might the future look like by 2050? This is on my wish list. So we build much of our cities and infrastructure out of carbon. It becomes a building block. Circular economy is thriving, especially for metals and plastics. World population has stabilized. Half of the land, 50% of land and oceans are preserved and restored as habitat for all our relations by 2050. We only live because they do, really. Mobility as a service in urban areas is a real thing. This is autonomous shared electric vehicle fleets. And once that's in place in urban areas, we don't need 60% of, up, excuse me, of the, the roads which are repurposed. Urban forests exist for, uh, for city shade and cooling and beauty. City gardens exist and are, are, everybody learns how to garden well for food, food security. Landfills are a thing of the past. Waste to power is, uh, is happening around the world. Virtual power plants and mini, MIDI, uh, connected MIDI grids are the way that we handle our grid systems. Capitalism has been fine tuned to, to close the rich poor gap and, and to re expand the middle class. It's social, social values shift towards having an elegant life. And, and my definition of elegance is beauty plus simplicity plus an excess of time. And all kids get an education to explore their own unique design and, um, and thereby have a chance, a good chance of figuring out their life mission or their life purpose. What might the world's future energy mix look like by 2050? This is my guess as of today, November, 2023. And that is, if we get it right, by 2050, the world would likely run on a 60 to 75% mostly clean, renewable electricity plus storage. This means wind, solar, hydro, pumped hydro, geothermal, wave energy, tidal energy, compressed air, run of the river, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we must double or triple our electric electric grid capacity while at the same time changing over to these low carbon power sources. And I see this done through MIDI grids, not mini grids or micro grids are too small and not main grids. These are too big, but MIDI grids will become more um, common as power is generated locally and consumed locally. It's decentralized and yet connected to other MIDI grids for backup. About 25 to 40% of the grid power from a, um, uh, will be from new, new nuclear. Currently we're at about 11%. So we'll be, we'll be building out more power plants, well, nuclear ones. 25 to 40% of the world energy will come from low carbon hydrogens. Three to eight percent from biomass fuels derived from plant waste, garbage dumps, poop. I think there'll be less uh, subs subsistence cooking fires from forests as affordable, renewable electricity and storage is built out. And less than 15 percent hydrocarbon burning, and over half of that will have um, emissions captured by carbon capture utilization and se sequestration. So Next, we will eliminate 30% energy waste. We waste a lot of energy. And um, by eliminating all the waste, we will have enough energy to both serve the population growth by 2050 and live most people, lift most people out of poverty. And we can get this, you know, that's assuming we can get this distribution thing right. So why is it so hard? to get off fossil fuel burning anyway. Well, currently about 80% of world energy comes from hydrocarbons. And it's so hard to get off it because of the services that are provided to us by hydrocarbons. They are energy dense. They have ease of transportation. 
energy storage from seasons to years, reliability whenever we call on them, and they're affordable. So let's focus on oil as an example for a moment. How many human work hours do you think are contained in a single barrel of oil? Go ahead, just take a moment, make a guess, write it down. All guesses are good. <laughs> why we call them guesses. <laughs> well, the answer is 4,053 human work hours in a single barrel of oil. That's two years of 40 hour work weeks. And at 15 bucks an hour, that's $61,000. And we pay what, a hundred bucks for a barrel of oil? That's why it's so hard to give up oil. We get $61,000 worth of work for a hundred bucks. That and the fact that our current infrastructure has already been built out to provide these services to us through hydrocarbon use. We already have the system in place. But we have to remember something. We consumers, we're the dog. World energy demand is the dog and energy companies are the tail. The dog wags the tail, not the other way around. Despite rhetoric in <laughs> rhetoric in the uh, in the news, they all keep producing whatever pro energy products people will buy. And what we want to buy is shifting towards decarbonized energy systems. Right now, society is built around thermal coal, metallurgical coal, oil, and natural gas. But all four of these are starting demand destruction. So we're going to look at that. And, but it's a quandary. Like, how do we maintain energy security using hydrocarbons while we still need them, while at the same time enabling their demand destruction. Hydrocarbon producers are looking at the early stages of demand destruction as the whole world is starting to choose something else. We will require hydrocarbon-based fuel, fuels to ensure energy security until we make that shift. But we have to get this timing right though. If, if we did not get this right, what might happen to your house? You know, if hydrocarbons were suddenly and prematurely withdrawn from your world, it's a quandary. Let's start with coal, thermal and then metallurgical. Thermal coal power plants have already been replaced by natural gas here in Alberta, in some countries by nucle nuclear. Um, uh, what also that also puts an end to uh, coal pollution like sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, particulate matter, mercury, arsenic. That coal plants routinely put into the atmosphere and the water, they're not good for anybody's body. Production from intermittent sources, renewables like solar and wind and pumped hydro, et cetera, plus energy storage in the form of batteries or hydrogen are starting to take over increasing amounts of the power load. Also, high industrial heat processes like glass, cement, ceramics are um, progressively going to hydrogen or uh, and or cleaner electricity energy to do their, um, to accomplish their hot industrial heating. Let's look at metallurgical coal. Metallurgical coal is used for steel making. It's a higher grade coal. And that is also going away. Iron ore, <clears throat> we wanna make that into steel. You need both at high industrial heat and a reductant to grab the oxygen away from the iron oxide, leaving the iron, which we call pig iron. And, and um, that pig iron gets in, turned into steel. Right now we're using coal to do that because carbon will grab the oxygen off the iron ore and put the CO2 into the atmosphere. But hydrogen does exactly the same thing. It's a, it's a reductant. So it both supplies the industrial scale heat and reduces the iron ore by grabbing the oxygen, this time to make water. Hybrid is uh, a company out of Sweden featured in this slide and they pioneered this process. This is the pilot plant that started up in 2021. And it's the process is spreading around the world. This is causing a demand destruction 
for metallurgical coal as we go forward. Let's look at liquid-based fuels. And the, so 70% of every barrel of oil worldwide is used for transport fuels like gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, and shipping bunker. These are progressively and chronically being replaced. Actually, this number is 78% from Alberta. <laughs> of our, of our uh, production is used for transportation fuel. Um, but, but why, uh, although we have reasonable ways to decarbonize industrial scale emissions, we don't have economically viable ways to decarbonate, to decarbonize the emissions from one car or one house or all of them together. These things need to be fueled differently. What do we replace fossil liquid fuels with? Gasoline and diesel are going to battery electric vehicle, hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles, hydrogen internal uh, combustion engines, hydrogen diesel biofuel engines. I switched in 2016 buying this used 2013 Tesla S85. And that's mine there in the, in the alley with uh, so my garage solar panels in the background, you can see. Jet fuel is going to SAF, which stands for Sustainable Aviation Fuel. And, and basically, it's a biology-derived um, fuel that um, is a drop-in for, for jet fuel. Um, so things like the fats from uh, restaurants that have deep fat fryers are perfect for making SAF out of it. Um, but also hydrogen. Um, <clears throat> shipping bunker fuels become uh, ammonia, maybe some natural gas, hydrogen, methanol. Let's look at some real world, ex world examples of this. Well, in terms of jet uh, fuel, the very, very first zero emission plane in the world was designed and flown by Vancouver's own Harbor Air in December of 2019. It was a small, battery electric aircraft used for short stops. I think it had about seven seats in it. And it was used to, that plane was used to go Vancouver, Victoria and back again. After that, <clears throat> Zero Avia uh, was next with its hydrogen fuel cell flight design. And here are two pictures of the many planes flying today on hydrogen. Um, Airbus and Zero Avia are both of those. And United is one of the airline companies testing SAF, sustainable aviation fuel, sometimes mixed with fossil jet fuel. Let's look at shipping, the destruction of bunker fuel. There are about 50,000 container ships in the world and they move 90% of the international trade goods around, around the world. It'll take some time to convert them all, but the conversion has already started. Here are some examples of alternative uh, fuel ships in service today. You see a hydrogen fueled container ship just announced two weeks ago, uh, a methanol fueled container ship, a hydrogen fueled ferry, and an electric tugboat. This is not pie in the sky stuff. Like this, this stuff is happening now. This is what demand destruction looks like in the early stages. But we will still need hydrocarbons for petrochemistry in the future. Here's a partial list from the United States Department of Energy. Maybe too small to read, I know, but you get the drift. Broadly speaking, we're looking at hydrocarbon providing us with the, the, the makings for plastics and rubbers and lubricants, paints, adhesives, chemicals, waxes, solvents, refrigerants, and other things. One of the things I really like, though, about doing energy transition today, now, is that these hydrocarbon feedstocks will be reserved for the future generations who need them um, instead of just being burnt. And, you know, they'll have these to make plastics and lubricants out of. 
uh, and at least until the Star Trek replicators are the norm. <laughs> we'll see if that ever happens. So the writing is on the wall and the oil companies know it. Even though the oil industry has largely stopped denying human caused climate change is a reality, one can understand why they want to delay credible climate action as long as possible. You know, with, with this demand destruction that we see is looming. They're taking a page out of the Merchants of Doubt playbook, right? Who's, who's spin doctors. Um, it this was their job to create doubt around tobacco. Here are the five main messages the current oil and gas industries employing, <clears throat> redirecting responsibility. This is just not our fault. Emphasizing the downsides and costs of alternatives. Surrender. We can't do anything anyway, so we might as well give up. We need to wait for technology. <clears throat> on the horizon, and then we will act. Fighting climate change is a losing battle. Another typical oil and gas com um, industry complaint is that, well, gee, Canada only emits 2% of world emissions. That's not significant. I say we're being asked to eliminate 2% of world emissions, and that's only fair. In a country like ours, where we have a high standard of living, good, ubiquitous education, inventive innovation culture, we are perfectly placed to capitalize on solving our own emissions problems and then prosper by selling those advances to the rest of the world. China is doing this really well right now. We could too. So how do we maintain energy security while decarbonizing our energy systems? Well, to start with, we have to make a clear distinction here between the goal by 2050 and the pathways we need to take to get there. These are two different things. We cannot take a step from where we're not. So we will be doing things today that we will not be doing by 2050 just in order to get there without you know, too many people freezing and starving in the dark. Unfortunately, there's no question that we're gonna to continue to need to burn fossil fuels in the near future because the energy transition can only be accomplished on the backs of hydrocarbons because there really is nothing else. We can't make decarbonized consumer energy choices in our own lives until we have built out alternative options that are dependable and affordable. That said, here's what I think will happen to the hydrocarbon demand between now and our goal by 2050-ish. Coal is in black, oil in green, natural gas is in red. Barring something nasty like, I don't know, World War III, which you know would unfortunately boost hydrocarbon burning for energy security, we are looking at coal and then oil demand destruction in that order. Thermal coal peaked in 2013 already. And metallurgical coal use has plateaued. My guess is it will start to decline within about five years. Oil demand is poised to drop as we discussed, and that leaves natural gas. I think, I think natural gas will expand in the short to medium term uh, for two reasons, it is half the emissions of coal for the same amount of energy, so we'll continue to be switched from thermal coal to uh, natural gas to produce electricity. And the second thing, uh, a new technology from Rain Cage Carbon, developed here in Calgary, enables us to to make bio gas and natural gas into the hydrogen carrier of choice going into the future. Um, this is why I have drawn it leveling out at a higher um, position than uh, either coal or oil uh, by 2050. Now let's look at rain cage. That's right. I didn't say natural gas would be the future hydrocar hydrogen carrier of choice. It's a bold statement. I know. And here's why I think that. 
there's this company has a radical new technology that can grab over 90% of the CO2 out of any industrial scale flue gas stream at any concentration. Imagine Canada, Canada could ship LNG to say Japan and they offload it and they put it into the steam methane reformer and they make hydrogen and CO2, the hydrogen for local uh, distribution to say their manufacturing district and the CO2 is captured out of the flue gas stream by the rain cage unit over 90% and they make valuable solid structured carbons out of it for sale into Japan's uh, manufacturing sector. This, we think that over 60% of the, everything that we use every day can be made better and improved with the addition of some kinds of these kinds of carbons, structured carbons. So I think there's going to be a market for it. And this is, this is coming. And I think it's a key part of the decarbonization pathway, in my view. Canada already has one LNG export terminal under construction in Kitimat, BC. Uh, we could use about three more. According to the Canadian Gas Association, as of 2022, Canada is estimated to have almost 1,400 trillion cubic feet of natural gas resources. This is an amount equal to over 200 years of, at current demand. Rain cage is, as, as I said, a bolt-on unit that can be added to existing facilities as well as to the new builds. And it outputs these useful graphene family structured carbon molecules. I'm talking like multi-layered graphene and carbon nanotubes and buckyballs, those kinds of things. And, and they can do this by the tons per day per site. So uses for these things, um, incorporating graphene into products, as I said, but you know, things like paints, adhesive, cement, strand board, building materials, car bodies, batteries, medical applications, power transmission, and other things. Like, like if you take less than 1% graphene and you mix it into cement, it makes that cement 30% stronger. So you need 30% less cement to do the same job. If you take less than 1% carbon nanotubes and you put and you put that into cement, then the result, resulting concrete is 40% stronger. So, you know, these are just some of the things that, that these, these molecules can be used for. But also, this technology means we'll be able to continue to burn hydrocarbons in plants we've already built, industrial scale plants that, that will then emit under 10% of their usual emissions. And this serves us well during the first half of the transition pathway. Uh, we will not have to prematurely mothball existing plants that, that make us power, and we can use them to keep the lights on while we work on decarbonization of our energy systems. 90% uh, emissions reduction might not be enough though by 2050, but I think um, it will help us cut emissions enough while we get there. So what can we actually do ourselves anyway? How do we be part of the solution? There are things that we can control according to our finances, our power, our creativity to accomplish. These things are things like home retrofits, retrofits for robustness and transportation choices. But we also have influence. And we can exert this influence over the system in which we find ourselves at home, in our neighborhood, at work, with our friends. We can also have influence through active, repeated, positive communication with um, friends, family, neighbors, and especially politicians. The key here is don't be scaring people with a barrage of negative climate facts because it puts them into to fight, flight, or freeze, which, which means nothing gets done. Instead, tell people why climate change matters to you. 
and then offer some real doable things that we can do together to mitigate it. This is an empowering way to communicate about climate change. Let's look at vehicle choices for a moment. This is my rule of thumb. If you currently drive a gasoline vehicle, then 80% of the time you're better off going battery electric vehicle. And if you currently drive a diesel vehicle, then 90% of the time you're, go you're better off with a hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle. That is uh, once there's sufficient hydrogen fueling in your area. Most forward thinkers will likely choose a battery electric vehicle or BEV for lower operational and maintenance costs though, especially if they have access to home charging. But why would someone choose a hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle? Because it does cost significantly more to run. Because, and the reason is because it has some really niche uh, performance advantages. Like if your driving pattern is to go really long distances or carry heavy loads of have, need high duty cycles, or you're frequently towing equipment, or or um, do a lot of of uh, cold weather driving, long distances, um, and and if you do remote wilderness driving, then you might be better off with a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle than a battery one. Another key technology that is gonna support our future grids um, with low carbon power is called the Virtual Power Plant or VPP. Solar Utility is a Calgary-based company working on virtual power plants for Alberta. Their role is to aggregate and supply home generated solar battery power to support the grid. It, it works like a co-op. So uh, Solar Utility will install at, at no upfront cost into your home solar panels, a battery, and uh, electric car charger on a 20-year lease. Imagine that all your neighbors do that. Together, you become a virtual power plant, and solar utility becomes your power provider. So when the, the grid is struggling, and there's more demand than there is supply, uh, instead of crashing the grid, the grid pays extra. For, for additional power, two and a half times they pay for the same kilowatt hour uh, at, at a minimum. And, and so solar utility draws power from our home batteries uh, that's been charged by our home solar, so it's green power, and sells it to the grid at a higher price. That extra money goes into the co-op and it's used and put against everybody's power bills. So the homeowner for, um, pays for power and the monthly equipment lease, which together are at least 30% less than you paid for electricity before. And the savings could be much, much higher. There are so many carbon, low carbon power options for our homes available right now. But here's a favorite, it just showed up, November the 2nd, 2023 out of Germany. And uh, it's, it's from Home Power S Solutions. It's, they say their new, they call it a Picea 15 kilowatt system. And it uses surplus power from your photovoltaic solar installations during the summer to produce home hydrogen via electrolysis. And that offers, it's stored on site and it offers 1,500 kilowatt hours of hydrogen storage capacity on site. This is huge. It's a hundred times what a typical home battery can store. So again, in the summer, the electrolyzer uses excess energy from your solar panels to produce green hydrogen, which is stored on site. And in the winter, electrolysis process basically runs backwards. And so the, the hydrogen is converted back to into electricity again uh, for use when it's needed. So those are a couple of examples of some of the awesome new technology that already exists. It's gonna help us move into the future in a way that, that serves us well. I think when we are all the ancestors, 
future generations will look back at us and laugh saying, I just can't believe they used to burn this, actually burn this really valuable stuff. <laughs> so thank you for your kind attention. And I hope this information and these perspectives have been helpful to, for you to consider. And uh, if we were live, I'd take questions now, but we're not. So feel free to contact me um, on LinkedIn or wherever you like. Thanks. Bye.